A functional DevSecOps implementation is still a pipe dream in 2021. Fundamentally, I feel we have focused a bit too much on fussing about what it is and how we should do it. Prescription after prescription after prescription on how to implement DevSecOps has not resulted in a better state of application security. The question then is, how do we break the cycle? The answer may actually lie in data and a few simple principles that we've known for quite a while. I spent a few afternoons last year with Ashwas Manral talking about the shared responsibility model for application security and using application security insights to drive the interaction between DevOps and SecOps teams. After all, that interaction is DevSecOps. Welcome to White Hat Security's AppSec Stats Flash, the monthly podcast on the state of application security. Hosted by Setu Kolkarni with analysis from White Hat's in-house security expert, Zach Jones. Today's special guest is Vishwas Monral, founder and CEO of NanoSec. Welcome to the AppSec Statistics Flash for January 2021. Let me take a minute to talk about the AppSec Stats Flash. Basically, it's a monthly version of White Hat's yearly statistics report, something we've been producing for over a decade now. And you can find the links to previous year's reports in the show notes, and we'll make sure they're added there. Now, the thinking behind producing a monthly Stats Flash is actually pretty simple. We feel that the threat landscape is evolving quite rapidly. And quite frankly, we need a more frequent analysis of the state of application security. And this monthly stats flash will do exactly that. It will help us reflect on that evolving threat landscape in a more contemporary manner, rather than the historical perspective that the yearly stats report used to provide. And what we've done is we've chosen a handful of metrics that we're going to track on an ongoing basis. And in each monthly episode, we'll bring forward some of the more important metrics and also talk to you about our observations around those metrics. Now, this podcast is a journey. It's a 12-month journey where I'll be joined by Zach Jones, our head of security research, and other industry guests to provide very topical insights into the state of application security, as well as what we can do to improve the state of application security. Today, we'll look at some important findings from the past year, from 2020. And in subsequent episodes, we plan to use a rolling three-month window to examine the application security data that we have and share our observations with you all. Now, before we get any further today, let me outline the structure of today's conversation. Basically, it's a two-part conversation. In the first part, we're going to examine some key metrics which we think best represent the state of application security today. By the way, I'll also have the detailed report behind these metrics shared via the show notes, so feel free to download them and have a look. And in the second part of the conversation, I'll be joined by Vishwas. Vishwas is the CEO and founder of NanoSec, which is now a part of McAfee. I will dig deeper into the concept of the shared responsibility model for application security with Vishwas, and we'll try to bring out some of the key first principles around using data to drive the application security conversation. All right, so let's get into it. One of the first things we look at closely here at White Hat is a metric called window of exposure. Basically, it tells us about the exploitability of any given application over a period of time. So if I say the window of exposure for an application called abc.com is six months, what that really means is that abc.com has at least one serious exploitable vulnerability open for at least six months. Now, the bottom line based on the data that we have is this. As far as window of exposure is concerned, in 2020, on average, applications across the board had a very high window of exposure. Most notably, if you look at the manufacturing industry, the entire industry had an extraordinarily large window of exposure. 70%, that's a high number, 70% of all manufacturing applications had a window of exposure of 365 days which really means that 70% of the manufacturing applications had at least one open, serious, exploitable vulnerability throughout the year. Now, while applications in the manufacturing vertical do not have hundreds of thousands of end users, these applications are nonetheless critical because they're supporting large, complex global supply chains. 
So the key takeaway here from this statistic is that more needs to be done in the manufacturing vertical to reduce the exploitability of the overall supply chain that these applications support. Now, the other vertical that is of key interest is healthcare. Healthcare applications as well have seen a dramatic rise in the window of exposure in 2020. The window of exposure grew from roughly 45% in previous years to close to 60%. In other words, on average, 60%, 60% of all applications in healthcare had at least one exploitable critical vulnerability open throughout the year. That's a pretty concerning metric. Now, obviously, there's been a tremendous amount of innovation in healthcare applications in 2020 for obvious reasons, getting digital healthcare in the hands of folks who are stuck at home due to the pandemic. And I think that has really created the need for speed in the industry to release applications much faster. And that in turn has resulted in security being left behind. Now, having said that, let me bring Zach in at this point. Zach, you obviously see these applications and vulnerabilities up close. Now, what do you think are some of the reasons why there's a jump in the window of exposure for certain verticals like healthcare? But on the other hand, another highly regulated vertical, which is finance, is seeming to do much better than previous years. Finance is clearly doing well. Obviously, many financial applications have direct dollars at exposure, and this has historically driven a focus on the security of those applications by the finance industry. Overall, one of the things that we commonly see when we see spikes or drops in measures like this in a specific industry or of a specific type really has to do with focus. We see that when certain industries focus on new things, changes in their industry, new trends, new markets, security often gets left to the side. Another interesting thing that we see in the statistics is that there's clearly a divide between groups of industries who are doing well and groups of industries who are doing poorly. There's a big drop right in the middle of industries whose window of exposure, 50 plus percent of their sites are exposed always, and industries who make it below that 50 percent line often begin to see the inverse of the statistic where the percentage of their sites that are exposed 30 days or less begins to grow significantly. So there appears to be a tipping point in efforts around remediation, secure development, and process that is easily seen in the window of exposure statistic. Thank you, Zach. Now, let's also switch our focus to vulnerability likelihood, and let's try to link it back to window of exposure if we can. We also track which vulnerability classes are more prevalent in the data that we see. I see this almost like a leaderboard of vulnerability classes, but obviously it's less of a leaderboard, but more of a notoriety board, if I may. Now the headline takeaway is that the pedestrian vulnerability classes always make it to the top. In other words, the most common vulnerabilities are also usually the straightforward ones to exploit. For example, We've seen consistently that over the years, insufficient TLS, meaning inadequate or improper use of SSL, is one of the most common vulnerabilities. But today, let's talk about another common vulnerability class called information leakage. We see that information leakage, much like insufficient TLS, is one of the most common vulnerability classes. Information leakage makes up 37% of all vulnerabilities we found in 2020. So Zach, Help me dig deeper into this, right? We talked about window of exposure, and then we're talking about vulnerability classes like information leakage that have high prevalence, almost 37% of all vulnerabilities we found were of this particular class. For our listeners today, what is this vulnerability class? How does this vulnerability class actually come into being? How do these vulnerabilities occur? And more importantly, what are some of the key takeaways that you can talk about around fixing these vulnerabilities? When we're talking about vulnerability likelihood, we're gathering this data from our dynamic application security testing. So in the case of information leakage, what we're seeing are applications revealing primarily very important details about their platform, their technology stack, and their backends out to the end users. 
that really makes up the majority of the types of information leakage that we detect. So things like providing a version number of a third-party software that contains a known vulnerability or revealing a stack trace in the response to the end user of the application that shows details about the code that's powering the application. Typically, this occurs in error states, and our dynamic scanner is very good at achieving error states within applications through the way that it tests. And the reason applications tend to reveal these error states really boils down to global configuration of the platforms and the frameworks that these applications are powered by. In almost all cases, modern application frameworks provide controls at the configuration level to determine whether or not errors being handled by the code should be provided to the end user or whether or not they should be suppressed and only revealed internally. So that ties directly to how these vulnerabilities should be and could be remediated, which is that developers and the operating staff of these applications have to have important knowledge about the configuration properties of their application stacks and know that those configurations need to be hardened. Things like debug modes being turned off prior to being released. And that's really how to fix the vast majority of these information leakages is to turn those things off. So this almost seems like a bellwether vulnerability class, doesn't it? It is. It, it speaks to sort of a level of maturity in the development and deployment of your application. Yeah. I wanted to reiterate or highlight the fact that these vulnerabilities are reported as a result of scanning in production applications. So they actually made their way through the entire SDLC without anyone paying close attention to them. And I feel if anything, our listeners today should look at implementing processes or controls within the development team to prevent these vulnerabilities. Finally, let's talk about a critical metric that reflects how well we are responding to the vulnerabilities that are found in applications. The metric I'm talking about is time to fix. Now, the time to fix metric historically has continued on an upward trend, and that's exactly what we're seeing from last year's data. I mean, can you believe it when I say that the average time to fix for critical vulnerabilities now has reached a whopping 194 days? It is a concerning trend when it takes on average 194 days to mitigate or remediate a critical vulnerability. Now, Zach, one of the reasons I think this is the case is the fact that organizations today are standing up more applications, pushing out more applications into production than they have the capacity to remediate from an application security perspective. We can confirm that when we look at some other pieces of data. We know at White Hat that we're being asked to assess an increasing number of applications each year. And we also know that while the number of critical vulnerabilities reported per site is decreasing, it's not decreasing enough to offset the increase in applications, which means we're reporting more critical vulnerabilities. Organizations likely are not seeing an increase in the resources follow an increase in the number of applications and thus vulnerabilities. This is evidenced in the fact that if we look at the trends for each risk level, each and every time that a specific risk level seems to reduce its time to fix, the other risk levels get larger. That seems to be an attention factor. When an organization is paying attention to vulnerabilities of one risk or one class, they're ignoring the others. Maybe what you're pointing out here, Zach, is, is potentially a silver bullet strategy. What if we just focused on mitigating and remediating whichever is applicable? Only the critical and high severity vulnerabilities as a principle, as a strategy across the board. It looks like adopting that strategy will not only positively affect the time to fix, which is it'll reduce the time to fix for critical vulnerabilities, but over a period of time, it will also result in a much better window of exposure metric for that particular application, which means the application will not be vulnerable through critical vulnerabilities throughout the year. 
I think a strategy like that can help an organization set a baseline. When you have critical vulnerabilities exposed in your application, what we're talking about is vulnerabilities that could today result in the complete compromise of the application. So paying attention to vulnerabilities of lower risk that likely require a complicated exploit or perhaps just represent some best practice or lack of security control really will not do you much good if you're still exposed for 190 plus days to critical vulnerabilities. And as you engage in the quick remediation of these critical vulnerabilities, your organization will develop a practice of remediation that can later be applied down the risk stack. I like the way you called it a practice. I think it it points to two things. One, a critical takeaway, right? A critical takeaway out of this is we've got to have a remediation strategy in place that every organization within the business is following. And what we are suggesting here is, at least to begin with, make this strategy be based on risk level. The other thing it points to is, like Zach, you said, right, the idea of having a practice. How do we make sure that the entire organization is contributing to the business of fixing vulnerabilities in applications? It's a perfect segue into my next conversation with Vishwas. What can we do to build a shared responsibility model for application security? Why? Because number one, we want to scale the application security effort throughout the organization. And importantly, also improve the state of application security across all the applications in the organization. Let's switch to the second section of today's conversation. And I'd like to welcome Vishwas Mandral. Vishwas, so happy to have you on, mate. Before we get into the shared responsibility conversation I want to have with you today, I'd love it if you could talk about your story and some inflection points in your career, especially talk a little bit about the company that you started and uh, eventually now you're a part of McAfee. Sure. Thanks for uh, for the opportunity, Setu. And I, I got to learn a lot from what uh, you and Zach just shared. And I love the fact, you know, the, the things that you brought up, right, about information leakage, about pedestrian vulnerability types being the most common, how long the vulnerabilities stay open, and the interesting factors like why critical vulnerabilities are getting remediated faster. So I really love that conversation. So thank you for all the information and thank you for inviting me. So of course, I can give you my background. My ba- I'm from, uh, you know, uh, I'm a technologist. I've been working as a technologist all my life. I've written some of the core security standards out there like, you know, DMVPN and MPLS and IPsec, so a lot of VPN kind of things in the past. I had founded another company called Ionis Networks before this, which was actually spun off into a couple of companies called Ionis Networks and LiveReach Media. And most recently, I actually started a company called Nanosec, uh, which after about uh, four years uh, in the journey was bought by McAfee about a year and a half back. I've since been at McAfee working as the Chief Architect of Cloud, as well as the head of their container security solution, which is what the NanoSec product was. So just giving a background of the problem and how the key inflection points, right? So like I said, I was a technologist all along in my life. And as I went through the journey, I realized being part of these larger organizations, right? it was harder for me to get my ideas into products. It took a very long time. And that's where I decided, you know what? I'm creating all these technologies. Why don't I just go out and try it if I can do it myself? You know, of course, I wasn't as successful in the first uh, first part of the journey, but as the in my second part of the journey where I was focusing on container security with NanoSec, that's where you know we got to become part of McAfee. The idea was very simple at that time, right? The what we were seeing at that time was there was end-to-end encryption coming in. There was you know very ephemeral workloads. You talked about developers becoming a key and core. And applications being deployed at a very fast rate, the average lifetime of a container being like two minutes, I guess. So in that kind of an environment, our take was, you know what, all this, while you can deploy applications faster, you need to deploy the network context and the security along with the application. And the way things are, when security is in the network, it cannot be moved as easily. Think of it, you know, your security being part of your, uh, you know, your firewall, intrusion detection prevention device. It would be very hard for the security to move as your application moves. And that's where we said, you know what? We are going to design a solution 
that let security move with the applications does not rely on end to end encryption is future safe looks at the new traffic security patterns right traffic patterns that are there which is about you know a lot of east west traffic versus the user to application north south traffic and that's that was what we did in nanosec and interestingly now all those technologies have become very widely used and we now see that being a critical part of a lot of the solution that a lot of cloud providers are now pushing with things like istio and service mesh and so on so that has been my journey uh, seto very interesting the way that you characterize kind of the the concept of being east west rather than kind of northbound and southbound now when you say east west are you also alluding to the fact that applications have become more api oriented more b2b enablement happening through the same application that is not only serving the end user but also being used by business partners as as a service absolutely so i i feel that there's a change in the way applications are made as we see right what is happening is companies to become viable have to innovate and push new value into the marketplace faster which means they have to enable their developers to develop faster which in turn means two things of course one part that you mentioned hey if there are certain pieces of the code or functionality that i can get through an api from a third party vendor i would use that or the second part that uh, i think uh, zack mentioned which is hey people are using third party libraries third party code and if i can use that code and push it into my own software deploy it as a microservice that is the other other thing that people would do so absolutely when i say east west versus north south it is a lot about deploying software faster it's all about building an application stitching together an application instead of building this huge large monolithic application and so yes the application development deployment monitoring is completely changing with this uh, new paradigm absolutely now let's uh, uh, turn our focus to kind of the topic that really you and i have spoken about multiple times last year and the year before around the shared responsibility model why don't you take a minute vishwas and talk about the shared responsibility model for security more broadly and once you've done that i'd like to then tease out some first principles that we can apply to devsecops obviously because when we say devsecops we are implying shared responsibility so if you can take a minute and talk about the shared responsibility model for security and then we can dig deeper sure so i think uh, we talk of shared responsibility model right uh, it's talked of in various different contexts you talked about devsecops but this it's also used between service provider and uh, you know uh, if you are sort of using the cloud so the cloud uh, provider versus a cloud user so shared responsibility model as we all know is a framework right to divide responsibility and accountability across different entities that are involved in creating a single task right so uh, which is you know securing or creating your application making it secure giving it reliability to your customers interestingly shared mis- responsibility model as you see it right is not just about you know security of course it's about you know if you see the affordable care act you'll see the shared responsibility between you know insurance companies individuals enterprise it's, it's everywhere right and of course it applies to devops and devsecops if you see what devops is right devops is mainly about a lot of continuous uh, you know should i say automation it's a lot about measurement but it's also about collaboration that right? bringing bringing teams together and once you automate and bring teams together it also means that different responsibilities for the various different teams and that's where the shared responsibility model comes in in a devsecops world there are certain tasks that are done by developers certain tasks of security that are done by the security teams and what we've seen in the field right and i'll tell you my my view of it i've seen three kinds of teams there are those teams that are uh, you know more traditional kinds of companies and and you know you'd be surprised it's more common than you would think where the security has very little knowledge of your development pipelines and so if people have to do devsecops it's actually a push function what that means is the security teams control certain aspects of either your configuration or your vulnerability assessment as soon as something is deployed they ch- because that's where they come in they do not know where the code pipelines are they look at the vulnerability assessment and fail builds or fail your you know deployment and then push it backward the second type of companies are where development and security are sort of tied in very closely together you see all the hyperscale companies that's what it is you know in fact i've i was talking to one of the bigger hyperscale company they said they did not even have a 
level one SOC, that is, you know, all the incidents that come in are actually automated and uh, and sort of assigned by software or AI software. And there's a team that works together, which includes developers as well as security analysts who work together to remediate the issue. So, so that's the second type of uh, company. But the most common kind of company that we see is this third kind, which is about companies that are neither extremely, you know, where where the, where the security teams are or have some idea of development pipeline, but they do not necessarily know everything. And then the cases where they have some control of, uh, you know, things in their development pipeline, but they cannot, uh, you know, control everything. So that's, that's the most common model of of shared responsibility that we've seen. And the way we've seen this being pushed, right, in the environments is the security teams start off in, in these kinds of environments, controlling things at the at the level of deployment, pushing things back to integration, pushing things back to build, and then sort of trying to you know get it across the environments. Right? That's that's the way we've seen it. So that that's where I see it from a DevSecOps side of a shared responsibility model. The other side of shared responsibility, like I said, was from the perspective of cloud providers and cloud users, right? Because now, unlike in the past, where the company or the organization where they had the private cloud, they had all responsibility for all applications, all security, right? Now, the, when you're going to the cloud, certain layers of the cloud based on the deployment model or the service model are owned by the service provider and certain layers are owned by the developers. And what we are seeing over there is there's a shared responsibility where there's a clear distinction in the obligation of what the service provider needs to do and what the user needs to do. And what I'm seeing in the shared responsibility model in the cloud uh, cases, there's a shift towards cloud providers taking more and more responsibility, getting giving de- uh, development teams and enterprises responsibility mainly for their applications and taking care of most of the infrastructure, the service layer, and so on. So that's that's how uh, the shared responsibility model, as I see it in the DevSecOps world, in the cloud world, and, and how it's progressing. So you, you use a word that I'm a little hung up on, right? You use the word control, and you were talking about kind of the most common type of company, which has the security team, which is kind of aware of what the development team uses and does. The development team is aware of how the security team operates. And you use the word control, and I, I'm, I'm a little hung up on the word control because I think therein lies the challenge, right? The fact that security seems to control and development seems to follow, I think that's where a lot of the breakdown happens in implementing that shared responsibility model. So is there anything in your mind, Vishwas, that we can learn from the shared responsibility model between the infrastructure as a service provider and the application development team? Is there any kind of first principle there that we can take and apply it back to the interaction between the development team and the security team? Yeah, I think the the things that we've seen, right, that that work are uh, basically around, you know, having collaboration, of course, like I said, it's about uh, a lot of measurement, continuous measurement, continuously figuring out, uh, you know, uh, uh, what is working, what is not working. It's about, uh, you know, end-to-end responsibility from from startup to grave. If you have an end-to-end responsibility, which means from development to test to production, and you know uh, you are owning the security all along. That's where uh, you know things actually work. It's also about you know uh, I would say things around you know learning from failures and continuously improving. I, I, I see those are the if you have that in your culture, you have that those in your processes, you have a collaborative environment where you're continuously learning and improving. I think those are environments where we've seen you know this 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 thing works. Like like you like you clearly pointed out, right? If we are talking of things in terms of hey. One team controls and the other team does not have a way or you know cannot get over it. I I think things do get challenged a lot because you know secu- uh, developers try to find ways around security, right? Around uh, uh, the controls and what ends up because they are thinking about uh, you know getting business logic out to, uh, to customers. And what we've seen is there's a lot of shadow IT, there's sh- a lot of shadow applications that are being used. Short of lot of shadow services in the cloud being used that people do not even know about, right? And so that's that's where I see what what sort of works in my view. Makes sense. So you said two things. One was measurement, and clearly what we are doing here with the stats flash is providing those relevant contemporary measurements that our listeners can use today to drive accountability. 
And the other thing that you spoke about, which kind of strikes a chord with me is ownership for security, right? At the end of the day, who could be a potential owner for the security of an application? And one of the things that Vishwas, I've spoken to you about, and maybe we'll, we'll, we'll figure out a way to talk about this in one of the future episodes, is the role of product management in defining the right exit criteria for a product that not just includes reliability, performance, but it also includes security. Maybe that's an, an area for us to explore in the future. Good. With that said, our time is up, folks, today. Uh, Zach and Vishwas, thank you for not just taking the time to be on the podcast with me today, but also love the insight, love the conversation. And to all the listeners, we'll be back again next month with a new episode and a new guest. Thank you for tuning in. Bye for now. Thank you for listening to White Hat Security's AppSec Stats Flash podcast. To learn more, download the report or visit us on the web at www.whitehatsec.com.